Let's start with prayer. Gracious Father, we pray this day that you might bless us once more with your Holy Spirit and with understanding from your word. Help us apply it in such a way that we may grow in strength of faith and in trust in you above all else. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. Verse 1. So I'll begin. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. All right. Uh, in the end of the previous chapter, uh, and Peter is continuing the so thoughts from there, uh, Peter talked about uh, prophecy and about Scripture, the nature of it, that holy men were uh, moved by the Holy Spirit to write Scripture down, uh, that, that God's Word is inspired so he sets the stage in chapter 1 of how the people of God are to be led by God's word and that it's trustworthy. Uh, so now he follows up by the fact that, uh, just beware of the fact that not everybody who claims to be one of these prophets writing scripture actually is, that there are many false prophets. So he's warning the people. And that, uh, you know, that pattern of both speaking positive truth and then warning about negative truth, that uh, expounding right doctrine and then revealing false doctrine. Uh, this is something that happens throughout Scripture that makes many in the world today very uncomfortable. People don't like talking about false doctrine uh, or, or accusing someone of false teaching. It's too negative. Uh, but that is the way Scripture works because false doctrine is soul-destroying and very dangerous. So people need to be aware of it. So, false prophets among the people, he says there in verse 1. There will be false prophets among the people. Uh, from among the people, meaning they will be from within the church. Uh, they will be the kind of people considered believers. Uh, the very thing Jesus warns about in Matthew 7 when he says, Beware of false teachers because they will come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. They will be dressed like sheep, like children of God. So one of the, the characteristics of a false teacher is it is someone who is not going to look like a false teacher. They are going to look like a believer. And their message will not seem to be evil on the surface. They'll have inviting personalities. They'll be likable people. Their message will be convincing for many. You know, thus lies the danger. A false prophet, literally pseudo-prophet is the Greek word. And a false teacher, he uses both terms in this, in this verse. Uh, there'll be false prophets among the people and there'll be false teachers among you. pseudo teachers. So if we look at this verse, we can pick out several marks of a false teacher, you know, besides just the one we've noted already, that they will look like believers. Uh, next mark, they will not be above board with their teaching. They will sneak in false teachings. That is, they will secretly bring in, as it says, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. So they're not going to say, hey, this is something new and different. They're going to say, no, this is what the Bible says. Pastor, yes? Do they know they're doing this? Or are they, is it un, unknowing that they're just thinking they're doing good, but hurting people? I think most of it is unknowing. 
I think most of it is they think they find something new and exciting that other people have missed and that it's their job to let everybody know about this amazing thing they have found. I mean, you know, even in our own synod, we have this kind of stuff, and it's very subtle, and people often don't get as excited about it as they should. Uh, but, you know, as an example, we've got a, a, a teaching a few years ago called something about the two kinds of righteousness, which there is a biblical foundation for. That is, there's the righteousness Jesus gives us that saves us, and then the righteousness that flows from us, you know, in light of being saved. It's, you know, the language the church has historically used for, for being a Christian and receiving Christ is law and gospel. We're condemned by the law, we're saved by the gospel. They started saying that this two kinds of righteousness thing can replace that old worn out language of law and gospel. And now we can talk about instead, or should talk instead, about Jesus' righteousness and the new righteous lives we're supposed to live. Focus more on that, less on law, less on condemnation of sin, more on the positive aspects of being a good Christian out there. Which, again, it's not biblically wrong to say there are these two kinds of righteousness, but then uh, starting to replace Another biblical truth, which is that the law is condemnatory and we need that as Christians in our lives at times, uh, and telling us to ignore that in favor of this other thing, you know, this is, this is how heresies happen. They thought they had something creative. They thought they had a positive focus, moving away from that negative old law stuff. People ate it up. Uh, a lot of the props at St. Louis championed it. Uh, it's, it's a heresy, though, because it's replacing a necessary biblical model. Uh, at, or at least de-emphasizing it to the point where it's irrelevant. So it's subtle little things like that that most people wouldn't catch. But in the process, then, you don't need the law, uh, and you should focus more on the good person you are. You know, so essentially, Methodism. <laughs> But they didn't know that. They couldn't see that. And even if you pointed it out to them, which many people did, they refused to, to acknowledge that. Uh, there's, there's something about academia. I'm, the older I'm getting, the more convinced I am. Nobody should be a seminary professor without at least 20 years in the parish. You get into a, you get into a thing where, in order to be a successful academic, you have to be creative. You have to come up with creative ideas. <clears throat> and in fact, that's one of the necessary parts even to getting a doctorate. When I got my PhD, you have to submit a original idea and have your thesis based on that, something nobody else has written about. Well, that pushes people to heresy, because now you've got to come up with something new and original and creative. And when you're talking about biblical truth, there is nothing new, original, or creative. But you have to make it sound that way. So you've got to come up with an angle on something. And this is, this is how it starts. You've got to make a name for yourself. You've got to be creative. You've got to give the people something new. And bam, all of a sudden you're off on a tangent and not teaching the truth of Scripture. So, yeah, to answer your question, a long answer. That's how it happens a lot of times, I think. All right, um, second point, uh, their teaching will be destructive to the faith, but it's not going to seem all that destructive to the faith. You know, like the two kinds of righteousness thing. Well, that's biblically true, except it just takes focus away. C, their teaching will ultimately deny the Lord who bought them. That's an interesting expression, the Lord who bought them. Uh, the, the theological jargon for that, it's called the vicarious atonement, or the, just the atonement itself, which means to buy back. Part of Jesus' death and resurrection is the buying back of us, meaning we were condemned to hell. 
and Jesus bought us back from hell at the purchase price of his own life. Now, we take that teaching for granted, the atonement. But one of the heresies and one of the angles of heresy out there, especially among liberals in Christendom, is to deny the atonement. Uh, saying that the model of Jesus buying us back from hell is a bad model because that means we're not good and we're on our way to hell. And that's not something they can stomach, that we have to be bought back from going to hell because that's where we were headed. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an essential teaching to our faith, and Peter is talking about it when he says, bought you, um, but it is denied. In fact, one of the things I remember at, at the SEM reading, uh, the, the ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, had a two-volume thick set called Christian Dogmatics where they delineate their doctrine. And it was shocking for me in these two-volume sets to find them actually coming out flat out in here and saying, that the idea of an atonement, of a buying back, is offensive to them. And it's uh, unpalatable, and it's an old, old view, and it has to be jettisoned. They, they outright denied the atonement word for word, and that's what they're teaching their pastors to do. Have been since I was in the sem. original problems. <laughs> yeah. And even the Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox have a problem with that one too, the idea of atonement. There's a Lutheran friends I had that abandoned Lutheranism and went and joined the Orthodox Church. That was one of their big deals was um, giving up on the idea of an atonement and looking at salvation in terms of a mystical engaging with God instead. It's bizarre. At any rate, Peter is quite clear about the fact that there is an atonement. We are bought back from destruction. All right, so um, heresies he talks about too. Destructive heresies in this last bit. Uh, that's an interesting Interesting word in the Greek. Uh, it means, uh, it comes from a root word meaning to capture. So it's something that captures you, a trap, if you will, something you get caught in, captured by. And the sneakier the trap, the more effective it is. Yes. So what is the what is the line that they cross? Because we all know those people, we've all been around them and they all, you know, what what is the oh, what's the first? <clears throat> what's the line they cross <laughs> to in to one way or another? Play? In one way or another, all heresies do the same thing. They wind up denying grace as the sole thing that saves us. So we say, are, are they the ones that say we have to accept Jesus? Is, is that the dividing line? Yes, and that, that is one of those ways that Jesus is ultimately denied. Because they, they will make, they'll still speak of Jesus as Savior, but they will add to it something necessary within ourselves to do along with him. So, yeah, Jesus still saves, but we have to accept him into our heart. Or we have to decide to follow Jesus. They will add themselves into the equation. And that ultimately takes away the very idea of the atonement. Jesus no longer is the sole purchaser of our eternal life. We have to contribute. So, yes, that is a denial, ultimate denial of Christ and a very dangerous heresy. And it doesn't feel like a heresy because they still got Jesus. And they still talk about Jesus dying on a cross. Uh, and they don't recognize the fact that by adding themselves into that equation of salvation, 
that ultimately they're denying Jesus. They don't see it, no matter how much you tell them. That's the, the nature of the veil the devil puts over their eyes. So it's a faith plus equation. Right. In other words, we say faith equals salvation, and they will say faith plus acceptance equals salvation. Faith plus doing good works equals salvation. Exactly. So just anything is added to faith, it's a, it's, that's the situation. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, and now the last asterisk there before the line, um, this is how one should see the teaching of Scripture or doctrine. Um, all doctrines are like the spokes of a wheel. All of them support the center, which is Christ. Cut any spoke and it affects the hub. Any doctrine taught falsely can affect one's overall understanding of Christ. So this is another one of heresy's little tricks is to say that they are not denying Jesus by any means. And that the, the teaching that they are a little different on is of such a minor character that it doesn't affect anything. As if you can, as if you can have a, a, a single doctrine that's a little askew, but everything else is still intact. That's not the way it works. Uh, everything supports the center. You cut a spoke, you weaken the center. You weaken the hub the support of the whole rim. All right, so uh, just a couple of points in our day, popular culture issues, and how, this, how these sneaky false doctrines find their way in and how destructive they can be to the hub, which is Christ. So consider the popular debates in our day and how, their impact, and how they impact one's understanding of Christ. Uh, one, the critical race theory issue which posits that all white people bear communal guilt for the age of slavery and that all white people are inherently racist. Uh, what Christian doctrines are challenged by this? Well, one thing original sin is, are all people equally guilty at birth of all sinful inclinations or are some born more guilty than others? And critical race theory insists some people are born more guilty than others namely white people. Two, the role of individual guilt and responsibility. See, the individual doesn't matter in critical race theory. All people bear guilt because of the sins of some within their race. This is a direct contradiction of Ezekiel 18, and that's worth looking at, actually. Ezekiel chapter 18, if you would look at that. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, if you, if you need to know. Ezekiel 18, because this, this is a direct exposing of this, of this sinful idea. So the word of the Lord came to me again saying, what do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So the fathers sinned. They ate sour grapes, and the children are suffering for it. That's what they were complaining to God. We're being punished because of the sins of our fathers. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. But if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, he uh, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing, if he has not exacted usury nor taken an increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. If he begets a son who is a robber or shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does none of those duties but has eaten on the mountains or defiled his neighbor's wife, if he oppressed the poor and needy, uh, etc., etc., end of verse 13, his blood shall be upon him. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers, but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, etc., etc., uh, verse 
17, end of verse 17, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. So the whole point of Ezekiel 18 is the person who does the thing will pay for the thing. And that sons do not answer for the sins of their fathers. So once more, it goes against the very heart of critical race theory, God's word does. Uh, three, on back on the handout here, under Christian doctrines challenged by critical race theory, forgiveness and grace are challenged. The very heart of Christ in Christianity is forgiveness, which lets go of the past and treat sinful people as if they didn't sin. Critical race theory refuses forgiveness and insists on holding all people guilty based on their race. So critical race theory champions openly deny Christ as Savior which they claim is a white idea, and insist instead on seeing him only in terms of liberator. So th this, this one little issue of all white people are guilty are, is in reality a direct attack on Christ. Doesn't seem like it at first, but it is. That's the nature of heresy. It ultimately denies forgiveness and grace. Uh, another big issue in our day, uh, this gender confusion thing. How does that affect Christ? Again, it doesn't seem on the surface to have a direct impact on one's understanding of God. It seems to be an uh, impact one's understanding of humanity. Christian doctrine's challenged by it. Uh, well, God's created design and order. Did God make male and female or not? Uh, biblical concepts of responsibility of men for women. You know, are, are men the head of the home? Are there, is there responsibility to care for, for women? Biblical sexual ethics. Uh, the nature of family. The nature of the church is the bride of Christ. The fatherhood of God. You know, if we don't know what male is anymore, how are we going to know anything about God? Because he's father. Or, or Christ, who is the son of God. Could Jesus have gotten a sex changed and still been the, the child of God and accomplished his work? For the gender confusion people, yeah, he could have. But, but no, he could not have. Because his work of redemption is directly tied to his maleness. So you, you mess with something like gender, you mess with the entire concept of God as father and Christ as his son. Everything falls. I personally think this is one of the more genius attacks of the devil in recent times, uh, attack on God. So at any rate, as one can see, and this was Peter's point, why it's taking a long time to get there, Peter's point is these attacks on Christ are subtle. They're not going to seem like attacks on Christ. And the people putting those attacks out there are going to seem like nice people that we can trust. Knowledgeable people, they're going to seem like Christians. So it's dangerous out there. How are you going to know? Well, you know, one of the first red flags should, that should go up is, are they saying something different than what I was taught? Are they saying something different than what God's Word says? You know, if they're saying something different than Scripture, that's, that's something that, that you can read it and it's just not there, but they think it is there, that's a pretty good indication. All right, uh, still end of verse 1, Jesus says, or Peter says, uh, they will bring on themselves swift destruction. Uh, the word destruction in the Greek actually means eternal destruction, perdition, damnation. All right, so what Peter is doing with warning about the nature of false teachers is something that Jesus himself did. So we've got other citations. We won't look at them all. But Jesus did regularly warn of false teachers and how dangerous they were to the faith. Don't trust people just because of who you think they are. Trust them only on the basis of what comes out of their mouth. Is it reliable to God's word? And I know that's hard. You know, I know it's hard to write, write personalities out of the equation, but you need to. 
Whether you like that person or not really isn't the point. Are they speaking truth? Uh, the false prophets are nothing new, of course. The Old Testament had them as well. Uh, again, we won't look up all of these, but uh, the, the nature of Old Testament false prophets, what God warned about there is they're going to say what people want to hear, uh, and they're going to deny God's judgment. That is, if God condemns something, they're going to say, ah, don't worry about that. He didn't really mean that. Um, you know, and they're going to talk positively. Always going to put a happy spin on things. Uh, they, uh, they did not cover up iniquity, meaning they did not expose sin. They purposely avoided sin to speak positively. People love that. People love positive things. Especially if their lives are kind of complicated. They love hearing that Jesus is going to take all the complications away and life's going to be great. Joel Osteen and that whole crowd on TV. All these positive self-imagers. That was the very heart of what the Old Testament false prophets did. And lastly, they're going to claim God said when in fact God didn't say. Always check against Scripture. Never just believe something that somebody says because you trust them to say it. It's okay to ask, where does it say that? All right, finally, verse 2, moving on. Uh, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Many will follow their destructive ways. They are going to have numerical success. That's the depressing thing about it all. They are going to draw people in and people love what they have to say. Tens of thousands of people go to these megachurches that preach this prosperity gospel every single Sunday. You know, it's curious, too, if you ask people how their church is doing or whatever, very often numerical success is one of the first things they cite. Oh, it's not doing good. We've lost a few members. Or, yeah, it's doing great. We're adding, adding members. Numerical success is actually one of the marks of false churches. <laughs> so don't put too much stock in numerical success. Many will follow their destructive ways. Uh, their destructive ways. Three words in English. It's only one word in Greek. And, and interestingly enough, it's a word that's used in connection with sexual sins very often. Uh, licentiousness, wantonness, outrageous conduct, conduct shocking to public decency, lewdness. Um, here it simply means, you know, this, these, these teachings that are so offensive to Christ. Uh, there, uh, let's see, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. That, that little expression, the way of truth, that's how they spoke of the early Christians. In fact, that, they didn't call the early Christians Christians right away. Uh, the first thing early Christians were called was the way. Members of the way. Uh, and throughout Acts, that's what Christians are called, the way. Followers of the way. So when it says, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed, it's because of whom Christianity will be blasphemed. Christians will be blasphemed. They're going to make Christianity look bad. People are going to talk negatively about truth because of them. Uh, so many who reject Christianity actually reject the character of Christianity. This is something else I've, I've found over the years. Uh, False teachers paint a kind of Christianity that is unreal. And a lot of times, people who hate Christianity only know the version of Christianity they see in false teachers. And that's what they've come to hate. I've run into several atheists, in fact, over the years, who tell me how much they, what a joke Christianity is and how much they hate it. And I ask, well, what do you hate about Christianity? And they will invariably point to these megachurch preachers. You know, I hate the fakeness of it all. I hate the focus on money. 
You know, and, and money is a big thing for a lot of them. It's all about money, getting more money out of people. It's a scam. Well, the reason they think that is because they have heard guys stand in front of others begging for money, telling them if they love Jesus, they've got to give more money. So I hate that too. That's not, that's not Christianity, though. That's the point. What they hate isn't Christianity. They think it is because that's all they see. And that's what false teachers will do. They'll turn people against Christ. Not against the real Christ. They'll turn him against the real Christ, but by painting Jesus in such awful terms, nobody would want to follow him with half a brain. So if you hear somebody that's putting down Christianity, it wouldn't hurt to ask them, what exactly do you not like about Christianity? Because you might be surprised that what they don't like isn't actually Christianity at all. And, and you might not like the same thing. It gives you a, a foot in the door. You know, really, you don't like that? I don't like that either, actually. And that's not Christianity. All right, verse 3. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. That's, a, that's another interesting expression. By covetousness, they will exploit you. What does that mean? What, what would a false teacher covet? What would, they, what would they see in the church that they might covet? Or that is desire in a sinful way? All right. Maybe. I'm thinking more in something more carnal than that. Money, power. Money and power, yeah. I think. Why would a false teacher get into the business of false teaching? <laughs> well, maybe they like manipulating people. Maybe they like the power and the fame. Um, that's, how, that's how a lot of people see the ministry, in fact. They see it as, as a power trip or as control. I remember when, when I first became a pastor, some woman in my, my home congregation back in Wisconsin, uh, after I was ordained, the first thing she said to me when she saw me after that was, so how does it feel to be in control? You don't know anything about the ministry if you think that's what it's about. But there, there are many who do think in those terms. Control, power, money. I think those are the baser things that false teachers covet. A pride, an ego, too. That, uh, that academic thing we talked about before where you've got to come up with something creative in order to get noticed, that's, that's an ego trip. In order to get, get noticed, in order to get a reputation. So pride is another thing. Okay. Um, also in verse 3, deceptive words. Uh, the word deceptive in the Greek is actually the word plastos, meaning plastic. Plastic words, uh, formed, molded, made up, counterfeit. Um, they'll, they'll shape words into whatever they need them to be to convince you of their opinion. They're not going to be true and honest. They're not going to be straight shooters. Plastic words, that's a great Greek term, plastos. Uh, and they will uh, exploit you with these plastic words. To exploit uh, a business term, meaning to buy, basically. They're going to literally sell you a load of goods with plastic words. So their judgment has been sealed. They're going to answer for all these souls they've led astray, even though in this life they may prosper and not answer. God ultimately will judge them. Uh, their judgment has not been idle. That is, they may be looking like they're getting away with it, but God sees what's happening. Their destruction doesn't slumber. It's coming for them. So how does this shape the picture of the church on the handout? A, it will not have great numerical strength. False teachers are said to have great success, not the church. B, it won't say what everybody wants to hear. Again, that's the role of the false teachers. 
C, its beliefs will be purposely uh, misrepresented and painted in the worst light. In fact, that's how they will gain followers away from the church. They'll try and make the church look bad. And D, it won't seem as nice to the outside world as the false teachers will. It's all of those things are there in these few verses in chapter 2 of first P, Second Peter. Peter's warning us. Verse 4, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to, into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. All right. Now what Peter's going to do in these verses, he's going to give us several examples to demonstrate the fact that even though it looks like the false teachers are getting away with it, God will judge them that we shouldn't worry about their apparent success. God knows how to take care of his own. God knows how to punish the wicked. And they're going to get punished. You know, just trust in God to be the one handling this, because uh, he will. So he uses in verse 4 now the example of the angels who sinned and the fact that God punished even angels. The sin isn't specified. God did not spare the angels who sinned. Doesn't tell us what the sin was. Uh, however, if we look elsewhere in Scripture, um, we can find some things that suggest that the devil's first sin may very well have been pride. He wanted to be like God because he was already so wonderful and powerful and mighty and beautiful that he wanted to be like God and, and be served, not be serve a servant. Um, so these fallen angels, these angels who sinned, are what we call demons. Which, uh, you know, again, think of the way popular culture represents demons as these frighteningly horrible creatures to look at, these these beings that are so grotesquely deformed that, you know, the very, the very glimpse of them sends you into a panic because they're so awful. All these dreadful horror movies and the, the demonic images they come up with. Demons are angels that have fallen. They were beautiful, beyond beauty that we can imagine in our material world. I have no reason to believe that visibly they changed their appearance. I think they're still probably what we would consider to be beautiful if we saw one. So again, the world wants evil to look bad. What Peter is saying here, though, evil doesn't look bad. That's the problem with evil. So even the demons themselves actually look like angels of light. And God punished them. Uh, he cast them down into chains of, delivered them, oh, excuse me, two expressions. First, cast them down to hell. Second expression, delivered them into chains of darkness. Uh, cast them down into hell. The Greek word for, for hell there, actually there is no specific biblical word for hell. That the New Testament borrows Greek words for hell. So the Greek, the, the Greek word for hell here is Tartaru. Um, Tartarus was the place of punishment in Greek mythology for gods. Uh, also called Gehenna, which was a garbage dump outside Jerusalem. That was another term Christians borrowed to describe what hell is like. It's like a burning garbage dump. So they actually used the word Gehenna, garbage dump for hell. And here they're using the, a word out of Greek mythology for hell. But it's this, this place where the condemned people are thrown. Into chains of darkness. You know, not, I think, not confining chains where they're chained to hell and they can't escape hell. But in terms of uh, enslavement chains, they are now enslaved by their evil and can't break out of it. They can't choose to be good anymore. 
Their fate is sealed. They are set against God. That's their chains of darkness. And delivered for judgment. You know, the, the Matthew 8 quotation there, uh, this delivered to judgment, is an interesting uh, thing. When Jesus cast out demons, this particular demon in Matthew 8, 29, uh, he says, let's see, suddenly they, that's the demons, the man who was possessed by many demons, and they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, uh, with, let's, Jesus, you son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? One of the things the demons said when Jesus cast them out is, are you going to punish us before the time? Meaning, they know full well the day is coming when they're going to be bound to hell. When their final punishment will be sealed. This ultimate end destruction. And they, they're worried about it. When they saw Jesus, is, is this our destruction? Is this it? So, this is something they are well aware of. Any thoughts before we look at verse 5? God punishes even angels who turned against him. So, so much more will he punish man, is Peter's point. Verse 5, And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, uh, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So there was a point in history God punished the entire earth. And if he did that, certainly he's going to punish these false teachers. Might not look like it, but he's gonna. So a judgment, uh, the pre-flood world destroyed, a judgment which did not just destroy ungodly people, but fell on all creation, even including the animal world. So complete was God's judgment. Uh, the third example. Verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. So God wiped out every man, woman, and child in Sodom and Gomorrah. T didn't just punish them, turned them to ashes. So God will keep his word of judgment, same as he will keep his word of grace. Those false teachers who so frustrate us because they don't, they're like jello, you can never nail them down, and they seem to get away with their false teaching, will answer for this. Verse 8, 7 and 8. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So the other side of the coin, not only will God punish the wicked, God will deliver the righteous. He's good for both promises. And he was able to deliver Lot and his family. Uh, oppressed, it says, how Lot was oppressed that is worn down, exhausted, suffering, worn out, overpowered. And, the, and the, the thing with Lot, Lot has always befuddled me. I cannot understand why that guy chose to live in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we need daughters for Pete's sakes. Why would you raise your daughters in that kind of environment? But he did. He somehow or another chose to live there and witness that grossness every single day. He had other places to go, unlike in our world, where, you know, where are we going to go with the same exact sin that's forced on us every single day, every time you turn the stinking TV on. Yeah, he could have gone east or west, but it doesn't mean he had to settle in Sodom and Gomorrah. They're, Pete's sake, live in a tent outside of the city if you have to, but why would you live right in the middle of it? All right, and finally, verse 9. 
Uh, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, uh, how to reserve unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So this is, this is the point he was driving at with all these examples. God knows what he's doing. We can trust that. You know, God is in control even if it seems like he's not. And as Christians, just because we see false doctrine around us and winning people away from the truth, we should not despair because God is still in control. Nothing is ever out of control for him, even when it looks like chaos to us. All right. Any thoughts, any questions, or comments on these verses from 2 Peter? All right. Let's close with prayer then. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being in control and for delivering us from evil. We pray that you might continue to do so, blessing us with your truth, strengthening us in it, and using us as your mouthpieces to reach those who are trapped by the darkness of this world, that they too might know your light and be saved. For Jesus' sake, amen.